Okay, uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, a long time ago, a, one of my mentors gave me uh, the instructions never to apologise for your talk, which I was in the habit of doing. So, but I will apologise slightly for this one. So, unfortunately, this is Karina's talk. She's not here because she's not she's not been well this week, and uh, so she. Um, uh, so I'm going to give the talk for her. I, I've, I've only just received the slides. I think she hasn't been able to completely finish them because she's not been well either. So I'll, I'll just try to fill in the story as much as I can. Um, okay, so, uh, yeah, so Karina Kervalchik is my PhD student uh, at Imperial. And uh, yeah, so previously you might have seen Karina speaking about, we, we, she started her PhD working on a project about some different finite element, hybridised finite element spaces. And we've changed gear now and we're looking into uh, some time stepping methods. Um, so it's a sort of related but uh, uh, different topic. So this is just starting really, uh, but it already looks nice. Um, and yeah, so the I, uh, if you look at this year's issue of Acton Numerica, you can see I've written a review, review article about compatible finite elements for geophysical flow dynamics. It's essentially really for reviewing. And uh, so they, there I'm kind of describing all the nice properties that the discretization has. And one sort of outstanding question is really what is the best way to integrate these uh, type of discretizations in time. And sort of the reason for that is that, so compatible finite elements, without going into lots of details here, they involve different finite elements for different variables, um, which have different degrees of continuity. So uh, there are HD elements where the velocity has continuous normal components, but not tangent, uh, tangent components, etc. And so they're all, all uh, and, then, uh, and then once you introduce vector into the system, which you need to do for fluids, then uh, it's a bit complicated to work out what, what the best way to do the time stepping is. Uh, so we've tried various different things, and so in this project, Karina's trying something new, which is based on some papers I've seen over the years by Rupert Klein, who is a finite volume person, uh, and so essentially what happens is that they use, they do a, a splitting between infection and what they call projection, which is like the wave path to a seat in a second, and the thing that they do is interesting is that for the infection part, um, the finite volume method is just cell centered, so all the fields are in the same place, and you just do classic finite volume like you learn the first time you ever see the finite volume method. Then, when it gets to the projection step, it's a staggered discretization so that it can be stable and you don't get any spurious modes and things like that, which um, happens at the end. And so, it's kind of taking the best of both worlds. And so, I was thinking, can we extend this compatible finite element setup um, and try to get so? Uh, using higher order spaces, so uh, rather than finite volume, we're talking about discontinuous Galerka methods, and then have a projection step that takes you back into the, the, the nice finite element spaces at the end. Um, yeah, so the goal, the, the idea is to try to let's take as big a time step as you can, and do and you know, make each time step as cheap as you can, and of course we want to be stable and accurate. Okay, so, um, alright, uh, so uh, Josh flash up the shallow water equation. So it's a, a mixed system, there's two variables, the velocity, which is just horizontal, it's a 2D equation, and the height of the layer. Um, so we tend to solve this on the sphere, in which case the velocity is tangential to the surface of the sphere, but still two-dimensional. Uh, so you have some nonlinear effective terms, and then there's some linear terms which relate to the wave propagation, and in fact the linear bits are here, here, and also uh, we break this into two pieces, so you can um, write D as a constant bit plus a perturbation, and then the constant bit gives you the, uh, the rest of the rest of the linearity. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, so now we're going to split those up. So just kind of explaining the splitting. Uh, so uh, how does Karina do this? Okay, so, so Karina has kind of grayed out um, yeah, so, you, so I, th I think this, this slide is just showing what I just said. So in the infection step, what you do is you, uh, so it's a splitting method, so what you do with splitting methods in general, split the, the bit that's not the time derivative, the, the tendency, into two bits, or more than two, and then solve the equation with one part and then solve the equation with the other part in some combination. So the, the first order splitting, uh, it says strang splitting here, but this is the, the strang splitting usually refers to the second order one. The, the first order splitting, what you do is you would ignore the linear parts for a while, um, and then just advect, um, just solve this advection equation. And in the, the form of the equations we've written here, it's a bit funny, so the, 
the height equation is a continuity equation, it's like a conservation law of mass, and then the velocity equation, you could have written that for momentum, uh, but um, it's written as an advective form, but it, I mean, you, you, if you want to make it all in flux form, you can, but we, we didn't do that. Um, but the finite volume people love flux form, so of course everything's in flux form for them. Uh, yeah, and then you just you solve this you solve this equation for one time step, ignoring the grayed out bits, uh, and then um, you solve um, the uh, so you take the result and then you step it forward with the rest for one time step. Uh, so now we've got the linear parts, the Coriolis force, the pressure gradient, and the bit that, the bits that were grayed out before. You're now solving those. So I think Green has forgotten to add this bit in gray here, but. Um, I think you get the idea. And, um, all right, so, uh, okay, so how are we going to organise that? So I'll, I'll tell you some things. I haven't looked at the slides very carefully, so I might tell you some things and then you might say, then we might find on later slides it's there. But let's, let's briefly summarise it for now. So this part, uh, we're going to use DG. So what you do is you take uh, the final elements. So, okay, so the, in this framework, the depth is already DG, so you can just do an upward D, DG formulation and we're going to do explicit time stepping. So you just have to solve the mass matrix for each, uh, uh, and we'll, um, we, we, don't, we can't just do forward Euler because it's not stable for higher order DG methods. So we do some kind of runge cotter method um, to step that forward. And, um, uh, and then we also do the same with the velocity. There's some, uh, it, it, yeah, there's, there's something else I should describe that's not quite written here, which is that there's, a, so U here is actually has two different uh, there's two different U's in fact so there's the U which is doing the transport so you just saw, uh, which is fixed over this whole step and then there's U that's being transported so it might be better to write U hat here and here uh, and then and then so what what we actually do is in the first order splitting you take the velocity from the beginning of the step use that as a transport velocity and then evolve u and d forwards using that velocity. So we're not actually so it's actually linear linear equation for both uh, both u and d. Uh, so so the velocity is from an h diff space. It's not just dis completely discontinuous. But what we can do is you can break it. So we just so Friedrich has what well, UFL has a broken element, which is what we use to do hybridizable uh, methods. So it ju it's just the equivalent. Find an element space, but with no continuity restrictions anywhere, so it's the same polynomials. And then you can just um, do, do DG advection with that, that part. Okay, so that, uh, yeah, and, and then, so because, so we, we're doing the next to lowest order spaces, uh, so you have to do uh, at least RK3 in order to have a stable method, it turns out. Okay, so that's all just math solves assembly, should be nice. And then, then we solve this part, and we solve this part using a backward Euler step. So it's a fully implicit, theta th equals one, um, and we can solve, so that is a linear system, a linear mix system, which we can also solve efficiently using hybridization. So hybridization, uh, I don't have time to talk about it now, but it's implemented in FireDrake, you can just select in the, uh, the Pepsi options, and it reduces, so it introduces some uh, fluxes on all of the edges and then it eliminates everything in favour of those fluxes and then you get a system that you could either for shallow water equations is 2D you should probably just use a direct solver or we want to go to 3D because that's where we live in 3D uh, so in that case um, you can then use a multi-grid uh, method applied to it and the point is that if you're uh, either doing using a direct solver or multi-grid in fact this, this step will be independent of delta T in terms of the solve time so you can take as big a step as you want, and the only thing it's going to, the only cost that's going to depend on delta t is if you have to do more sort of sub time steps in the advection part in order to uh, overcome the CFL condition. Presumably becomes inaccurate. Oh yeah, who cares about accuracy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. So yeah. So but it, it's usually the case with these fluids problems that you hit CFL issues before you hit accuracy ones. So it's sort of. You'd like to, you normally want to be able to do some sub cycling, especially with these DG, uh, these rubber cutter methods. The CFL constraints are quite restrictive. Um, okay, so, um, right, yeah, so here, um, so here we sort of see some of the information I just told you represented in this table. So on the left, we've got a, so left, what we see is a, um, 
Actually, it's not not completely right. So these these stars should be ends. So this is so what I think what Karina wanted to write here was a Ford Euler step uh, applied to those two equations using this u bar, which is at the be beginning just the velocity from the previous time step. Uh, and then you can compose these Ford Euler things into Runge-Kutta methods. Um, and when you're discretizing space, you can use upwind dg, and then it's a, it's a nice scheme with lots of nice properties. And then hopefully, as Karina's written, hopefully it's a low cost even for a large DT. You just have to do mass, more mass solves. It's quite local. Probably we can cram a few of those in for the cost of one projection step. And this is just repeating what I said before about uh, solve the projection step with backward Euler, uh, and then use hybridization to, uh, um, to solve it. And then, so what happens is at the end of the projection step, so U star is no longer satisfying the con constraints of the normal components being continuous, because we broke them by doing this DG step, but the projection step puts you back into the H div space again, so that's why it's called a projection step. Um, okay, so that's the, that's the idea. All right, so um, let's criticize this a bit. So it's a first order method, so first order accurate is not very accurate. Secondly, I'm using backward Euler here, which is super damping. It just eats waves for breakfast. Um, so what we want to do is we want to adapt this into a second order scheme. Uh, oh, uh, I, what do I see here? Okay, possibly that's not, uh, not that important to cover. All right, so, okay, so what's the second order scheme? So the second order scheme is the strand splitting. Uh, as I normally think of it. So what happens in this, and it's quite related to, in fact, how the Met Office time-stepping works in, uh, in Gung Ho and the Unified Model, for example. So what happens is that in the second order scheme, you do one half step uh, of an explicit time step applied to the linear part, the wave part. Uh, and then um, at the end of the step, you're gonna do one half step of backward Euler. And then if you ignore the middle part of that sandwich, that's just, that is just the, um, the crank nicholson scheme applied to the wave equation, which is second order accurate, and it conserves the wave amplitude exactly, so um, that's nice. And then we insert into this sandwich some advection in the middle, and we're going to advect with u bar, which is the velocity, and then for this whole, whole thing to be second order accurate, we need to advect with a, a uh, approximation of the velocity at time n plus a half, um, which we don't have. So in fact, uh, mate, well, yeah, well, oh yes, yeah, Karina has written up on this slide. So in fact, what you do is we do need that previous scheme that's not accurate. So what, so you so you do the the previous first order splitting, and it gives you a stable approximation. Uh, so you just do it over half a time step, and it gives you a stable approximation of the velocity at time n plus a half, and then you use that as the u bar, and then you do the whole second order step. So the whole so the whole cost of the second order discretization is you have to do two sweeps. You have to do one backward oiler. I mean, it's the projection step that's the expensive part, really. So you have to do one backward oiler projection step for the to get u n plus a half, and then go through the whole thing again and do a backward oiler step at the end to uh, to make the, make the second second order method. Um, okay. So that so and this this idea of doing a back the, the, the first order step to get an approximation of the velocity at the half value and then using that to evect is what happens in Rupert Klein's approach to the finite volume methods. Um, and so it's interesting because it's different from what most weather operational weather models do. So normally what they do is they just iterate this cycle a few times and when you get the, you get the velocity, you start, you originally use u bar equals u n, and then you take the u n plus one and then you kind of feed it through a few times to make it stable. Uh, but I, I didn't actually realize until talking with Rupert that you, you don't seem to have to do that. You can just kind of get an approximate value at the n plus a half step and then use it in the, in the next suite through. Please. Thank you. Um, all right, so we, yeah, so I don't have much more to say. So we, we, so we, so Karina has implemented this and got a kind of nice code where she can test out different types of methods and things like that. Um, there's a movie which looks a bit weird, but I, um, so this is the Williamson 5 uh, test problem up until 15 days. She's plotted the velocity and she's rotated it in a bit of a strange way, so I wouldn't want to look at it like this. So, but I, I can promise you, I've seen the solutions on Paraview and it looks exactly like the normal time stepping. And it's, and, and it's you know, the energy looks nice and it's not blowing up. So, uh, yeah, so, so, so had Karina had a bit more time this week, she probably would have incorporated the, those results into the slides as well. But so what, yeah, so what we, what we see is confirmation that this time stepping method works for the, the 
which has inshallah water equations, even though you may not believe me, but uh, we, we, um, you know, we, we're ready to, to write it up and uh, show that kind of stuff. Okay, so what's happening is we want, really want to do it for 3D. So 3D, there's also a temperature variable, which is also a mixture between discontinuous and con continuous. So we do the same thing with the temperature variable as well. So we break everything and then uh, advect it forwards using DG and then use the projection to get the continuity properties back in. Again. And in this case, for the Euler equations, the projection step actually involves non-linearity. It, it's non-linearity from the equation of state, not from the advection, so it's a kind of more gentle non-linearity, but we need to address that. Um, yeah, adapt adaptation scheme will likely be needed to do with the, how we do the linear solver and non-linearity, but I have, a, I have a plan for all of that. I think that's probably my last slide. Yes, it is. Thank you. Yes. And that, that is talking about for compatibility, right? The, the projection part. Uh, it's just to split the, the it's just because that give, that's the that's giving you the wave part essentially. So the fast you want to have all the fast motion in the wave part of the splitting scene. So does, does it work if you take a piecewise constant average? Oh it's, it's constant in time. I mean it can be it can be it can vary in space. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, and, and in fact so this is so we call this like a refer a background field or something like that. So in fact, ideally, so the, the Met Office forecast model they don't have fixed background fields. They use background fields from the previous time step. In fact, so that's also something we should we should include as well to make it more standard. Last question. That was great. I want to try it out. <laughs> um, where would physics fit in? Um, well, I think it's very similar to the. To just the, the normal end game stroke gung ho time discretization, so I suppose it just fits in however you. Some would, things at yeah, the start, it's just, some it, things in the middle. It's kind of replacing the, the semi Lagrangian infection in the middle of the, in the middle of the solve, so as usual, I think is the answer. Great, thank you again,